the brand new chair, so it sounds kind of funny to me to even hear that come out of my mouth, but that's what I am. And uh, I'm a colleague of our speaker today, Dr. Jeffrey Davis. Uh, Jeffrey uh, has been with us since 2002 as an associate professor of political science, uh, and he's going to be talking today about justice across borders, the struggle for human rights in U.S. courts, uh, and the talk is based on a uh, Cambridge University Press book of the same name that just came out in the last, really last few months, I guess. And Jeffrey was just commenting to me how difficult it is to distill a 300-page book down to a uh, PowerPoint presentation <laughs> of this length, so we wish him the best. Uh, basically, um, Jeffrey Davis, uh, just to say a few words about him, uh, in the great uh, sport of cricket, there is an expression for a player who's good at all aspects of the game, batting and bowling and fielding, and uh, that person is called an all-rounder. And uh, Jeffrey Davis is what I consider uh, to be an excellent all-rounder. He not only has a book just out with Cambridge University Press, he has won our Teacher of the Year Award in the Department of Political Science uh, multiple times. He has um, more than carried his weight when it comes to various types of service uh, in the department and around the university. He's extremely involved with uh, human rights issues uh, in his own personal life, uh, volunteering a lot of his time uh, in that uh, direction. And so uh, I feel very fortunate that we have him in our department, and I think the Social Sciences Forum is very fortunate to have him speaking here. So without further ado, except to remind you that there is a reception with food and drink after this, I turn you over to Dr. Jeffrey Davis. Thanks, everybody, and uh, thanks to Professor Haggerty for introducing me and for the Social Science Forum for inviting me to talk about my, my work. Um, I don't think I expected ever to be uh, introduced with a cricket analogy, and um, I'm pleasantly surprised to see how that went. Um, okay, so uh, the title is obviously Justice Across Borders, um, looking at a phenomenon that is um, crossing the world, really, of trying human rights cases a long way away from where the violations took place. Uh, I'm giving this talk today as our Justice Department prosecutes uh, Chucky e. Taylor for torture in Miami, Florida, for torture committed in Liberia. So uh, this is something that's going on right now. On the morning of March 26, 1976, there was a knock at the door of uh, the house of Dr. Joel Filatirga in Asuncion, uh, Paraguay. Uh, he was, the doctor was in the country treating patients, and his daughter Dolly answered the door to find that there were two uniformed police officers waiting for her. These officers took her to the house of the, the Paraguay police chief, uh, to where she found her brother, her brother's body. Uh, Dolly found that her brother, Joelito, a 17-year-old boy, had been tortured and killed by the police chief. The family believes he was killed because of the father, Joel Filatiga's opposition to Paraguay's dictator, uh, Stroessner, at the time. When Dolly went to the house, the uh, police chief told her that the family was getting what they deserved and that maybe now they would keep quiet. And Dolly remembers telling the police chief, um, tonight you have the power over me, but tomorrow I'll tell the world. The family tried to get justice for the killing in Paraguay to no avail. Um, the mother and, and, and sister were both imprisoned for a short time. Their lawyers were imprisoned, tortured, and eventually disbarred. You can see that this case isn't an isolated incident of torture in Paraguay. Uh, from Dr. Filatiga's uh, opinion here, um, his quote here. This is something that doesn't just go on in, in Paraguay, but was going on all over the world and is still going on. And the frustration for these victims is the inability to find justice, the inability to get someone to acknowledge what's happened to them. A few years after this, Dolly Filatiga found herself in the United States seeking political asylum. And she got a call from a friend who told her that the police chief, Peña, was now living in New York City, 
She called a contact of hers at Amnesty International and asked if anything could be done to go after the man who tortured and killed her brother. The contact at Amnesty was, was not uh, entirely encouraging, but he promised to make some calls. And he called uh, on a young lawyer named Peter Weiss at the Center for Constitutional Rights in New York. And you can see the, the conversation here as Peter Weiss remembers it. Amnesty called him up and said, hey, there's this torturer here. He's living in New York. He's going to be deported in a few days. You have to go after him. And of course, doing so is a monumental task. So Peter Weiss asked, how am I going to do that? And uh, the answer from the client to the lawyer is as it always was. Well, that's your problem. You figure it out. So with three days before Pena was to be deported, lawyers at the Center for Constitutional Rights had to look for a way to go after him, to hold him accountable for the torture and murder of Joelito Filatiga. And they did. They found a 200-year-old statute called the Alien Tort Statute, or the Alien Tort Claims Act. Passed with the first Judiciary Act of 1789, the statute allows aliens, non-citizens, to sue in federal court for violations of international law. Since the passage of the law in 1789 and 1980, when this case was filed, it had only been used a few times, and almost never successfully, and never for, to try to go after someone for a human rights violation. So in, in breaking this case, and filing this case, uh, the Center for Constitutional Rights, CCR, was really breaking new ground. And uh, really, no one believed they had a chance at all of succeeding. So within 24 hours, they found the law. They wrote the complaint. They took Dolly's statement. They served uh, Pena in the detention center in Brooklyn, New York. And they had a hearing set at a federal courthouse in New York City for torture committed in Paraguay against a Paraguayan citizen by a Paraguayan citizen. Truly an unprecedented case. The Filatigas lost in the, in the district court, in the trial court. But when the case reached the Second Circuit Court of Appeals, the Second Circuit ruled in their favor. They interpreted the Alien Tort Statute to allow cases brought by aliens for violations of international law as long as those international law violations could be found in U.S. common law, as long as the international law in question was part of U.S. common law. And here, the court concluded that torture was one of the only violations that could meet the rigorous standards there. And you can see the language from the court's decision. Whenever an alleged torturer is found and served with process by an alien within our borders, the alien tort statute provides federal jurisdiction. The law doesn't allow cases for any international law violation, only those that are universally condemned. To use the language of the court here, the violation must command the general assent of civilized nations. And with torture, the court pointed out, everyone condemns torture, even those that perpetrate it. Even in 1980, with this first case, the court knew that it was firing a small salvo in this, this campaign for global justice. And you can see this quote from the court that finished its opinion, uh, that its holding would be a small step, a small but important step, in the fulfillment of the ageless dream to free all people from brutal violence. But for the, for the Filatica family, it meant that finally somebody listened. Somebody was willing to hear evidence in the case. And somebody was able to rule that, that, that uh, Peña, as part of the government of Paraguay, uh, tortured and killed their son and brother for political reasons. So after this case in 1980, uh, there were numerous cases filed. Not a lot, but, but enough to, to make this interesting. Cases against Ferdinand Marcos, cases against the apartheid regime, against President Mugabe, against Karadic, against oil companies like Unicol and Chevron, uh, against Jiang Zemin, and uh, as I watched the Olympics and saw the chair of the Beijing Olympics, Liu Qi from China, he's been the defendant in an alien tort statute case as well. And so in looking at these cases, and all these cases that are going along, several compelling questions are raised. The overall question here is, are these cases a sign that the United States court system is embracing universal jurisdiction? that it's opening its doors to human rights claims for violations that occur all over the world. A controversial claim of jurisdiction 
And if it's doing this, this is really a monumental movement here. It's definitely, it's definitely something. Something is definitely going on. Courts are allowing these cases to proceed. And so what's driving this revolution? What's the impact of the small human rights NGOs that are bringing most of these cases, that are litigating these cases? Why are they so successful? Typically in international affairs, this, we see separation of powers concerns play a dominant role. The courts are more than willing to defer their judgments to the executive branch and to the legislative branch. Is so that going on here in these cases as well? What happens when the president litigates these cases and says, we don't think these cases should go on? What happens when these cases are filed against private companies like corporations, private defendants like corporations? And so what is the impact of these cases? Do these cases even matter is the final question. The answer to the first question, what's driving this revolution, is pretty clear. It's these small human rights groups. There are really four of them bringing these cases, the Center for Constitutional Rights that found the law, the Center for Justice and Accountability, Earth Rights International, and the International Labor Relations Fund. If you add up the lawyers for all of these uh, NGOs, you come up with about 20 lawyers working on these cases. Um, 20 lawyers working for NGOs working on these cases. And they've had a monumental impact with just a few uh, lawyers working on these cases. So what have they done? What have these rights groups done? First, they discovered the ATS as a tool to achieve accountability for human rights violations. Then after Filatiga, after they discovered it, they've expanded its reach to reach higher ranking officials, to reach corporate defendants, to bring in additional violations, like accusing Karadic of using rape as a tool for genocide, not just torture, but other violations. They're pushing a broader human rights agenda using these cases, like trying to incorporate universal jurisdiction, the idea that egregious violations can be tried anywhere in the world. They're trying to challenge US foreign policy on human rights using these cases. And they're trying to facilitate the impact of these cases in the local communities here at home, the El Salvadoran community, the Guatemalan community here in the United States, and also facilitating the impact in the home country where the violations took place. So uh, again, fitting a 300-page book into a short talk, I'm not going to talk about all of these. I'm sure you'll be relieved to hear. I'm just going to talk about a few of these here. Expanding the reach of the ATS to the higher ranking defendants, corporate defendants, and this question of impact. During El Salvador's civil war, Juan Romagosa Arce was a doctor treating anybody who needed help. He was in a small village one day uh, administering vaccinations when the army pulled in. He assured his patients that everything would be fine, they were doing nothing wrong, but when they opened fire, he knew uh, things had gone horribly wrong. Romagoso was arrested and detained by the military. He was accused of providing medical help for the insurgents, for the rebels, and he was detained uh, for several weeks and tortured the entire time he was there. Years later, he found himself in the United States. He moved to Washington, D.C. and opened a free clinic and he was contacted by the Center for Justice and Accountability. And they told him that the generals who orchestrated El Salvador's campaign of terror, the, the oppression uh, that occurred in El Salvador, were now retired comfortably in Florida. And that CJA was mounting a legal case against them. And they asked Romagosa to be a part of the case. Too often, we minimize that choice, the choice of a plaintiff to be part of a case. But the Romagosa case won't let us do this. Uh, when a victim of torture <laughs> testifies in a case and files a case, almost always that victim is re-traumatized. When they testify, they go through the torture they went through when they, uh, when they were actually being detained. And participating in the case was extremely difficult for Romagosa. Not only for him personally, but threats were issued against his family in El Salvador, and attacks were lodged against his clinic here in the United States. Nevertheless, he went through with the case. Of course, this is a different case. The generals who were the defendants didn't actually administer the electric shock. They didn't actually hit Romagosa. They didn't actually fire the bullet into his arm to prevent him from ever committing, uh, performing surgery again. These guys were at the top. They were the defense ministers in El Salvador doing part of this. So they were going after the intellectual authors of the system that allowed the torture to happen. 
a very different kind of legal case and a very important case. Too often in human rights, it's the foot soldier who gets punished while the intellectual authors go free. So in this case, we see that change a bit. The Center for Justice and Accountability was able to convince the court, both in Florida and then eventually the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals, that you could file a case under the old doctrine of command responsibility and hold the commanders responsible, responsible for the human rights violations committed by the troops under their command. You need to prove that the, that the um, commanders knew or should have known the violation was going on, that the troops who committed the violation were under their command, and that the generals could have, could have stopped it if they had decided to do so. Romagosa and his co-plaintiffs won the case, and they won over $50 million against the generals. So in the area of human rights, it's a monumental case. But for Romagosa and for the other plaintiffs, the meaning was both personal and also um, valuable for their community, for the community of victims from El Salvador. And you can see the quote from Romagosa right after the case. He wasn't thinking about his own personal victory. He was thinking about those who had suffered with him in his country years before. I wanted to cry, cry out for all those who died in the streets, died in the country, died anonymously. I think they would be happy. His lawyer, Matthew Eisenbrandt, who uh, litigated the case on his behalf, pointed out how important it was and how monumental it was to bring these generals into court. These generals who, as he says, ruled El Salvador with an iron fist. Even just making them testify was an incredible victory. So in addition to expanding the reach of, of human rights law and the alien tort statute to higher level officials, these interest groups, these human rights NGOs, have also used the law to go after some of our biggest corporations. At the time this lawsuit was filed against Unicol, it was the biggest corporation in the world. In the, 80, in the early 90s and late 80s, Unicol got a contract to build a natural gas pipeline in Burma. Instead of hiring their own, um, their own security force, they hired the Burmese military. Burmese military, of course, not known for their friendly attitude towards human rights. A young American law student named Catherine Redford was actually working and doing research in Burma while she was in law school. And she met Ka Swa, a Burmese human rights activist, while she was there. Swa had taken cassette recordings of victims in Burma who claimed that Unicol and the Burmese military were burning down their villages and enslaving people to work on the pipeline project. He had hundreds of these statements that he had smuggled out of Burma, taped to the bottom of farm animals uh, so they wouldn't be detected by soldiers. Ms. Redford came back to law school in the States and asked her professors, hey, what can we do? What can, you know, call is an American corporation. Can we do anything about this? And all her professors said, no, we can't do anything about this. It's happening over there. Eventually, she came across the Center for Constitutional Rights, the group that found the ATS. And eventually, she started Earth Rights International, her own group. And they filed an alien tort statute claim against Unicol. Now, traditionally, only states, only nations can violate human rights. Private entities, private people like us and corporations cannot. So how do you accuse a corporation of violating human rights law? How do you win this case? To do so, they had to prove that Unicol was working hand in hand with the Burmese military to commit these violations, to commit the torture, to commit the slave labor. And you can see here from the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals judgment, they were able to do so. They were able to convince the court that, that the Burmese security forces used these human rights violations, violence and intimidation to relocate whole villages, enslave farmers. And I apologize that the slide is a little off. Apparently, when it was converted to this computer, it, it's a little off. And I apologize for that. But you get the idea from the quotes. The court concluded that you could go after private corporations for human rights violations as long as they are severe human rights violations, like genocide and war crimes. 
and you could go after them for aiding and abetting human rights violations, for helping these violations, if you could prove that the company offered practical assistance and encouragement to the security forces. So when I met these lawyers bringing this case, I said, how in the world did you prove that the biggest company at the time was involved in slave labor? How did you get the evidence? All this was happening in Burma. And they looked at me and they said, well, that's the joy of civil litigation. In civil litigation in this country, you have discovery. They got all of Unical's documents, all of their emails, and they were able to find that Unical knew this was going on from Unical's own documents. So I just have a few of these here. This is an email, again, kind of uh, scrunched up at the bottom, but you get the idea. This is an email from um, a consultant hired to look into the allegations that slave labor, forced labor was going on in Burma in the pipeline project. And you can see that the consultant said that it might be. The Army is using forced labor. I certainly imply that they might, and they might. But it's not our problem, he said. That's the Army's problem. The company has its responsibilities, and the military has their responsibilities. So let's admit that if there's a question of forced labor from the Burmese military, that with regard to the companies, Unical and Total, there's a gray area. That was the approach the corporations took. Even more damning, I hope. The photo is of a Burmese villager who was burned uh, when her village was destroyed by Burmese security forces for the pipeline. And this is a quote from John Emley, the CEO of Unical. If forced labor goes hand in glove with the military, then yes, there will be more forced labor. In other words, in hiring the military, the CEO of Unical knew that there would be more forced labor. So finding this documentary evidence that linked the company to the human rights violation allowed these interest groups and these, and these Burmese victims to win this case against Unical. They won in the district court. They won in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. And while the case was awaiting rehearing, Unical settled the case. Um, and uh, from what the lawyers have told me, they settled this case in a way that was very, very favorable to the victims. So these are just two examples of how these little NGOs have expanded the reach of human rights law using this 200-year-old law here in the United States. And after these cases, after the Romagosa case and the Unical case and the Filatia case, the Supreme Court in, in 2004 upheld this approach, upheld the principle that you can use this law to go after violators of human rights. And the case there is called Sosa versus Alvarez Macaín. So when you look at how well these, these uh, NGOs have performed, one of the things I noticed in my research is how successful they were. In cases they file in district courts, they won 61% of the decisions. Meanwhile, it, plaintiffs represented by private law firms, even the biggest law firms in the country, only won 20% of these alien tort statute cases. In courts of appeal, their success rates were even better, 71% versus 16% represented by private lawyers. So why are these little poor NGOs so successful in these incredibly difficult cases? Several reasons. First, because human rights is the, is the reason for these groups to exist, they develop very strong relationships with the clients that they retain. Second, they're part of a large human rights network that exists not only in the United States, but internationally and in the countries where these violations take place. Third, they only do these cases, so they have an area of expertise. Fourth, they have very limited resources, so they're incredibly selective. And fifth, they work with some of the biggest law firms, so they are able to tap into these resources that law firms offer. One element of this, when you develop strong relationships with clients, they trust you. They trust you as a lawyer. When you're part of a human rights network, you can tap into activists all over the world. You add that to just legal expertise, 
And you achieve one of the hardest things to do in these international human rights cases. You find the crucial evidence. As you can imagine, finding the evidence to prove a human rights case for a violation that took place in Latin America or Africa uh, isn't easy. It's hard enough to find an eyewitness to a crime committed in Baltimore, never mind an eyewitness to a crime committed in the jungles of El Salvador. So it's, it's one of the most important parts. Filing the case is one thing, pro proving it and winning it is another. So a couple of examples of this. One of the most historic and tragic political assassinations in modern history was the assassination of Archbishop Oscar Romero in El Salvador. Romero was, I've heard, described as the, the region's Martin Luther King. He was a voice for the poor and a voice for peace in El Salvador. On March 23, 1980, he gave this sermon in, in San Salvador, demanding that the military in El Salvador stop the violent repression that it was carrying out against the people in the Civil War. I, I order you in the name of God, stop the repression, he said. The next day, he was assassinated. No one has ever been punished for this. No one has ever been prosecuted in El Salvador. No one. Then one day, the Center for Justice and Accountability discovered that Saravia, one of the alleged architects of this assassination, was, had retired to Modesto, California. They were able to find a relative of Romero, someone who remains anonymous for his own safety or her own safety, and they convinced this person to file the claim. They filed an alien tort statute case against Saravia, alleging that he was responsible for the assassination of Archbishop Romero. The first case uh, trying to prove accountability for the assassination. Of course, filing the case was monumental, but they had to win it. And to do that, you needed to find an eyewitness to one of the most notorious assassinations in political history. How do you find an eyewitness in the situation where anyone who knows anything is going to be in hiding for fear of being violently quieted. Through their connections with the Human Rights Network in El Salvador, CJA learned a about a rumor, a rumor that this person, Amado Antonio Gare, was actually the driver who drove the assassin to the church that day when the assassin killed Romero. And so they started looking into this. They traveled to El Salvador, they drove through the villages, they made phone calls. Again, through their connections with local human rights groups in El Salvador, they learned where, where Gare's family lived. And they went to the village, and they talked with people. And as you can see, you know, in those small towns, everyone knows everyone else. They got some more connections and eventually learned where Gare was hiding out. He wasn't hiding out in El Salvador. He was hiding out under the Witness Protection Program here in the United States. And so through some channels with the federal marshals, they contacted him and asked him to testify. And a few weeks later, he contacted them and said he'd agree. So at this trial in, in California, for, uh, accusing Saravia for the, um, accompl accomplice, being an accomplice in the assassination of Romero, there he was. Uh, and he told the story. He told the story how he, this driver went to the house of General Dadusana, a very powerful figure in El Salvador, and that Saravia was there and that Saravia talked to the assassin and gave the order to the assassin to shoot for the head. The driver then drove the assassin to the church, watched as the assassin pulled the trigger, drove the assassin back to the home where Saravia told them that Oscar Romero was dead. And then with that testimony, they were able to win the case and hold uh, Saravia uh, accountable for this assassination. Without this group's expertise, without their commitment to their client, Without their connections with local groups in El Salvador, they never would have found Gare. They never would have found their eyewitness. It's a crucial element here. This is even harder when you deal with the human rights violation of disappearances. When a government disappears someone, they vanish, and there's no one who knows anything about what happened. It's one of the reasons the violation is so hard on the family. They don't even have a body to mourn over. A young uh, teacher, Manfredo Velasquez, was disappeared in Honduras. And you can see the quote from his mother, who searched for him high and low to no avail. Once again, in the States, they file a suit against uh, 
General Grijalba from Honduras, for orchestrating the campaign of disappearances. Again, they need the eyewitness. How do you find an eyewitness for someone who's disappeared? And again, through their connections with human rights groups in, in Honduras, they not only find the person, but they gain his trust. And they end up meeting at a hotel in Guatemala, and he agrees to testify. And you can see from the court's decision here the testimony. This man, Aguilar, was in the prison cell next door and heard the disappeared, Manfredo Velasquez, cry for help. The person in charge of that prison where this took place was the defendant, Grijalba. And that's all you needed to tie the defendant to the victim and win the case. Someone who used to practice law, the relationship these groups develop with their clients really intrigues me. And I think it's a vital reason that they're so successful. One of the attorneys who works on these cases, Almudena Bernabiu, uh, described it this way. She was representing Guatemalan uh, victims of genocide committed in Guatemala and was going to uh, work with them while they were interviewed by a judge. The judge was going to interview them there. A Spanish judge was going to interview them in Guatemala. But the judge couldn't make it, so she was stuck spending the evening with just the victims. And as she says, the victims, they didn't even speak Spanish that well. They speak their own uh, Mayan language, Tutsuil. And so instead of talking about the case, they spent the time building trust, just talking about family and soccer, food. And so that way, because they were able to develop this trust with, with the, the lawyer, the next day, when they were asked to talk to the judge about these horrible violations, they were able to do so. You can imagine that a victim of a human rights violation, when the oppressor has been the judge, has been the lawyer, has been the police officer, has been the state, trusting those people to help you isn't an easy thing to do. So this relationship is a crucial element of these cases. You can see, according to Almudena, Without that family time, there's no way that these victims could have testified. Okay, let's shift to a different part of these cases. When you file these claims, they involve international relations and foreign affairs. And this manifests in two ways. The first way is when you file the claim against the United States. And when you file the claim against the United States, of course, the United States argues that it cannot be held liable because it is, is immune as the sovereign or because it's exercising its foreign policy and therefore cannot be held liable because of the political question or state secrets doctrine. To date, human rights plaintiffs have been, have been completely unsuccessful in suing U.S. officials for violating human rights. They've lost every single case. And the reason for this primarily is the doctrine of sovereign immunity and the doctrine of political question. Um, just to give you a quick example of sovereign immunity, in a case uh, emanating from Guantanamo Bay, um, Rasul versus Bush, several uh, detainees claimed that they were tortured in Afghanistan and they were tortured in uh, Guantanamo Bay and they sued under the Alien Tort Statute. And the court dismissed these claims and said, no, you cannot sue the United States. You can't sue officials of the United States because the United States, as the sovereign, as the, as the government, hasn't consented, hasn't agreed to be sued under this law. And the, and the uh, plaintiffs argue, hey, you can't do this. The government in the United States only has the power to do what the law allows. If they're committing torture, that's against the law, and they have no authority to do that. So therefore, they're outside the government, and they can be sued. Well, the court didn't buy it, and you can see here the quotes. They found that the torture was incidental to the officials' legitimate duties. It was foreseeable, given the orders given by the Secretary of Defense, that they were acting in the furtherance of the interests of the United States, and so therefore, you were basically suing the United States, and the United States can't be sued without its consent. In addition to these cases against the government, the United States actually intervenes in cases against other defendants, cases against corporations, cases against foreign officials. 
And if you look at the way this has progressed, since 1980, all the presidents have actually intervened in these cases to some degree, two or three cases during a president's term. Typically, they do so because the case itself is challenging or contradicting a foreign policy issued by the president, by the government. For example, President Clinton intervened in a case against Japan for using Korean comfort women, basically sex slaves that Japan used during World War II. Clinton said this case shouldn't proceed because it contradicts the, the armistice treaties signed with Japan at the time. A specific policy the administration says was contradicted. Once the president, President Bush took office in 2000, the level of involvement in these cases skyrocketed. The president immediately intervened in, the, in far more cases and tried to wipe out the doctrine established in, in the Philatica uh, case. Um, and a prime example of this is the Unicall decision I talked about a little while ago, the case against the corporation. In that case, Clinton had intervened and said, yes, this is a good thing. We're criticizing Burmese human rights as well. Go after these people. As soon as Bush took office, he filed a brief, his lawyers filed a brief saying, no, this case has got to stop. It interferes with, with foreign affairs and, and, and the Florida case and that ruling should be overturned. Um, so a complete shift. And so one of the things I looked at is what's motivating this? What's motivating the Bush administration to intervene in so many cases? and to try to stamp out this line of cases. And there are four real motivations. Foreign policy, ideology, avoiding reprisal litigation, and responding to political pressure. So first, foreign policy. As I mentioned, the Clinton administration intervened in some of these cases for foreign policy reasons as well. But the Bush administration had a much broader interpretation of what kind of case actually interfere with foreign policy. For previous administrations, the first Bush and Reagan and Clinton, it had to actually contradict a current uh, administration policy. For the administration currently in office, the Bush administration, as long as it was in the area of foreign affairs, the administration wanted it out of the courts. As soon as it annoyed a trading partner or an ally, the administration wanted it out of the courts. And so in talking with lawyers for the State Department, you can see some examples here. There were cases against the, some Chinese officials. Um, and the Chinese officials protested to the State Department. You can see that the State Department was, believed that the, the protests were very, very strong. They were, got pretty nasty, he says. And that was enough to get the State Department to file a brief saying these cases against the State Department, against the Chinese, should be dismissed. It wasn't that it contradicted U.S. policy. At the same time the case was going on, the United States, the State Department, is criticizing the exact same human rights violations that are at the subject of the lawsuit. The lawsuit agrees with the State Department. And yet, just because it's in the area of foreign affairs, and just because it's interfering or, or aggravating our, our trading partners, the administration wants it out of the courts. So I asked the top lawyer at the State Department, why? Why this involvement? Why spend so much time here on these cases that actually agree with your positions? And what he told me was to gain control of our foreign policy when otherwise and we might lose it. And you can see the administration wants to manage its foreign policy without any interference from the judiciary. There are ideo ideological reasons as well. The administration has a different view of the proper role of the judiciary than previous administrations. The current administration believes the judiciary should not have a supervisory role over administration actions in the area of foreign affairs. We've seen that in the media through discourse regarding the, the so-called war on terror. But it applies in these cases as well. And you can see again William Taft, the legal advisor, making this point in an interview. There's just not a lot of sympathy with the idea that the courts had any expertise in this field. There's also an ideological view that international law should not be enforced in the United States. 
And I asked this question from several lawyers and got a similar answer. What's the administration's view on the enforceability of international law? And as you can see here, the top lawyer at State said, well, they have a pretty dim view of the role of international law. Okay. There is also a concern about reciprocal, litig reciprocal litigation. What happens if people start suing the United States or people start accusing the United States in foreign countries? That was another concern, another reason the administration wanted to stamp out this precedent. And one of the lawyers litigating these cases, James Hergen from the State Department, said, you know, basically, hey, we have reciprocity problems. We don't want Rumsfeld sued in Germany. We don't want Bush sued in France. That's why we have to stamp out these alien tort statute cases. The administration, by the way, also makes that argument in their briefs. When they file a brief to dismiss the case, they'll often say, if the court rules this way, it will set precedent that it's acceptable for other countries to file claims against U.S. officials. So this is not a secret argument they're making. This is an overt argument. The final reason here is uh, responding to political pressure. Responding to political pressure. One of the things that seems to have gotten the administration's attention are these cases against oil companies. And indeed, you could, if you go to the lobbying disclosure reports, the reports that these companies have to file if they lobby the administration, you can see evidence of this. I hope this is visible on the slide. We'll see if it is. Well, we'll see. This is a lobbying report filed by Exxon shortly after it was sued for human rights violations. And you can see they identify right there, they're, they're lobbying the executive branch on alien tort reform. They want to get rid of the alien tort uh, statute. Has to do with a case in Indonesia. They're lobbying about Indonesia. And you can see here they're lobbying the Department of State. And the officials I talked to at State agreed, yeah, they, when there's a case like this, these, these uh, companies come in. Apparently uh, Exxon had uh, Bob Dole come in on their behalf and talk to them about getting rid of these cases, about the State Department filing a brief in the court against this case on the behalf of the defendants. And indeed, the State Department did so in the Exxon case. In fact, the Bush administration filed the brief for the defendants in every single ATS case against an oil company. And there have been 11, by the way. So in addition to the other three reasons the administration is so interested and so involved, there's also the, the standard political reason, the political pressure from, from outside. You find that in any other sort of uh, uh, political decision that an administration is making, probably. Okay. All right. So giving you a little encapsulation here of, of uh, what's been driving this revolution, how these NGOs have been so successful, of the separation of powers interests that are going on, the, the conflicts going on, the separation of powers arena. One question that comes up is, is you know, how, are these, how are these cases actually playing out? You know, what's really the impact? And I'm not going to talk a great deal about the, the statistics behind this, but to give you an idea of the conclusions here, when an NGO is involved in a case, even if you consider all the other reasons a case might be decided, these human rights groups are winning 34% of the time, 34% more than if it was a represented NGO. So if you, if you have one of these cases, if you're represented by a human rights group, you have a 34% uh, better chance of winning the case. If the United States government is a defendant in the district court, you have a much less chance of winning. We saw that in our discussion here. 31% less chance of winning against the United States. Citing a universally recognized human rights violation like torture is very important as well. It increases the likelihood of winning 21%. And you can see similar numbers here for the Court of Appeals decisions. The only difference here is the corporations are more successful in the Court of Appeals. Cases against corporations in the Court of Appeals, you have a 19% uh, less chance of, of winning these cases. I'd be happy to talk about this in more detail in Q&A if you'd like. I want to um, drown this talk in, in numbers. <laughs>
So in, all, in looking at all of this, you know, one question that comes up is, do these cases matter? Do they have an impact? Or are they just you know, political discourse? While my, my book, my research wasn't designed to systematically measure impact, you know, there was a lot of anecdotal evidence that comes out of the research that suggests what kind of impact these cases are having. The clearest signs of impact, as you would expect, are on the individual clients themselves, the victims themselves. But there's also impact that you can see on the community from which these clients come. There's impact on the corporations that are the defendants in these cases. Uh, a few years ago, the, uh, a group of corporations got together and drafted voluntary protocol on international trade in human rights and included a list of do's and don'ts in human rights. Nine of the 11 corporations that signed on to it were defendants in ATS cases. So it's altering their behavior as well. These cases create a historical record. You're forced to prove these violations using evidentiary standards. And there is some measure of punishing those responsible. Just to give you a small example of the impact on uh, individual client, individual clients. I was speaking with one of the lawyers, uh, as mentioned earlier in the past, Amudena Bernabeu from CJA. And I asked her about this impact. You know, does she see impact when she, when she litigates these cases? And she sat in quietly for a minute, and then she told me this. She said, well, the hardest experience is mothers who've lost their children. There is no justice for them. It breaks my heart. Their pain is not just in their heart. It is physically showing. They are tired, and they look older. This is why our work is justified. When the cases are over, my clients are beautiful again. And every person I talk to, the, the victims and the, and the lawyers, recognize how these cases have helped their clients not forget what happened to them, but take the next step in their life to move beyond it. From the first case, one of the first cases I talked about, the Romagosa case, here you can see another statement of impact. But he exposed the generals and was able to look them in the face when the truth was being told about all the crimes that were committed. Now they're in the hands of justice, and maybe they, not, they, they never thought that they would face justice. So, so no one, not even the advocates, think that these cases are the perfect solution. When I asked the lawyers litigating these cases you know, about this, they said, well, no, this is one of the worst ways to handle human rights violations. A civil lawsuit in the United States, but it's the only way they've got. It's the only way they've got. And so for now, it's one solution. And uh, in looking at these cases, they, they are proceeding. There have been cases filed in recent months against Blackwater for violations that took place in Iraq. There are cases uh, proceeding right down the road here against officials from Peru um, for torture and disappearances that occurred there. Okay, questions please. Yes? Does it look like the uh, Bush administration is going to intervene on Blackwater's behalf? They haven't so far. Um, if they do, I would say that they will probably do so uh, on very sort of strict legal grounds that um, there's this um, government contractor doctrine that uh, says that if the contractor is acting on behalf of the state, they can get some of the state's immunity. Uh, but typically, if they're violating human rights, that doesn't apply. But they may make that kind of argument. Yeah. Um, in the cases against the government, do you think that after Bush leaves office, there would be the past, or after the Bush administration leaves office, that there would be another chance to try that since they're no longer part of the government and they can't make those arguments? No, I don't. I don't think so. I think that the, the doctrines of, of sovereign immunity and the political question doctrine, which I didn't talk about today, um, I think those are, those are pretty well entrenched in the courts and um, it would be unlikely to see the courts sort of shift on that. That will take you know, appointing new and different judges over years and years. Um, it, it is possible, however, that the cases will be filed against some officials by the new Department of Justice, you know, criminal cases. Um, I, I wouldn't hold your breath for a prosecution of Rumsfeld or, or anybody like that, but you might see some, some cases come up. Um, 
you're probably not going to see a lot of these officials traveling to Western Europe very often because there there is a much greater likelihood of, of at least charging them criminally. They probably won't go anywhere, but at least being charged criminally there. So, but odds are it's a long way off before government officials here travel. Yeah. To what extent is the question applies to the uh, the, well, it's, it's managed to shut down every case against the United States in which it's been used, okay? And the argument there, uh, one of the most interesting cases was a case against Kissinger. Uh, Kissinger uh, helped Pinochet take uh, power in Chile a few years ago, and in doing so, uh, hired some people to kidnap General Schneider, a Chilean general. Unfortunately for Kissinger, they killed him. They killed General Schneider, fortunately for Schneider as well, I presume. And they, Schneider's sons sued Kissinger in federal court. And their, um, their argument is, hey, the political do question doctrine says that the court can't touch something that the executive branch or legislative branch has the power to do in the Constitution. Nothing in the Constitution gives the executive branch the power to order the kidnapping and, and killing of a foreign official. Right? That's against the law. And so the political question doctrine shouldn't apply. But the D.C. Circuit rejected those arguments and said, no, they're, they're exercising their prerogative in the area of international affairs, and that's the end of the question. So they wouldn't, it's this, it's this separation between questioning the policy and questioning the action. The, the plaintiffs in these cases say you can question the action that the administration takes, the actual killing of somebody, the actual kidnapping of somebody, but you can't question the policy, the policy of toppling Allende, for example. And so the distinction there is what the plaintiffs wanted, and the court wouldn't make that distinction. They said, no, they're one and the same. They're one and the same. You can't question the action without questioning the policy. Uh, in cases against other defendants, the Bush administration also argues the, the political question doctrine there as well, against private defendants and, and, and other foreign officials. And there, they're far less successful in winning those cases. Yeah. Has the US government ever lost a, a case with regard to torture? Uh, with regard to torture? Uh, well, there have been pro small torture prosecutions against people involved in Abu Ghraib and, and, and in previous conflicts as well. No one a high ranking. Um, and in these, in these cases, in the alien tort statute cases, the United States has only lost one case, and it was this obscure little case about a foreign contract, about a cable TV contract for a military base. And it didn't really make much sense. So. But beyond that, they win them all. So, yeah. Crimes are so egregious that in fact all of us the same we're seeing it. But I would like you to talk about what you think the boundaries of this process are. Uh, human rights are defined differently in different documents by different uh, cultures. Different court systems would apply different types of standards. Uh, one could imagine a world in which there was an enormous amount of litigation going on at the time. Where, where do you think the line should be drawn between when courts properly can take jurisdiction and intervene and, and when that would be Yeah, it's a great question. In the Supreme Court decision uh, allowing these cases to go forward, the Supreme Court was um, adamant that the door isn't wide open here for these kinds of cases. It's just ajar. It's just open a little bit. And it's not open for every sort of international law violation that's out there. It's only open for those that are universally condemned, those violations that are universally condemned. And so, uh, so far that has meant torture, crimes against humanity, genocide, and slavery. And, and that's all. And um, they're the same violations that in other countries have given rise to universal jurisdiction. In other words, courts in other countries have tried criminal cases against people who committed their violations beyond their borders for those violations. So I think the limit there is in those violations that give rise to universal jurisdiction. Those violations that we've been saying since Nuremberg are, are so egregious that um, the victim isn't just the person suffering. The victim is the, is the community, the global community. Um, and those violations, I think that's where the, the limit should be. So far, most of the courts have, have actually um, used that restraint. Uh, you have very few examples of courts coming in and upholding violations. Uh, there have been cases, for example, for environmental violations, for polluting a river. Um, and those have, have failed every time. And so far, courts have used quite a bit of restraint. Um, Congress, of course, you know, could play a role here in, in defining this area and defining the, the limits, as you suggest. 
And they've done so with one degree. They actually passed a law in 92 called the Torture Victim Protection Act, where they endorsed the Florida case and gave US citizens the right to file these claims as well for torture and, and uh, you know, crimes against humanity killing, extrajudicial killings as well. So uh, perhaps those are the limits that, you, that you're looking for. Yeah. I'm not, first of all, I'm not a lawyer, so Congratulations. this is probably a silly question, <laughs> but um, from what you're saying, it seems like it might be against the law for the United States to even consider being part of this international criminal court thing. I mean, could the Congress vote to subject the U.S. Mm -hmm. to uh, the U.S. To, to the criminal court, to the international criminal court in The Hague? Could they do that, and would that would that be consistent with our laws? And the other question is, since everybody everybody knows, I'm being facetious here, that the United States supports human rights. Well, how can I mean, how are we regarded in in international human rights meetings? I mean, how do the people in Amnesty International and the people that are working their tails off to you know? get some sort of justice, how do they, what is their view of the United States? Because it seems like like we're a huge power against human rights from what they're saying, or am I just overreacting? And remember the first question was about- Yeah, let me answer, <laughs> let me answer the safe question uh, first. Uh, and, and you know, would it be unlawful to join the International Criminal Court? And, and the answer is no, it wouldn't be unlawful um, if, um, if the Senate ratified the treaty, it's already been signed, although President Bush tried to unsign it. I'm not sure if a president can actually unsign a treaty, but assuming <laughs> the next president signs it again or, or whites out the X or whatever, um, the Senate could ratify it and, um, and that would become the law of the land. Um, the laws that prevent us from holding the government accountable for human rights, sovereign immunity and the political question doctrine, are, are products of tradition, products of legal tradition and therefore a treaty would supersede them. And so the Treaty of Rome, which would uh, give us consent to, to, to be part of the ICC, would supersede these legal doctrines. Um, and there's nothing in the Constitution that I know of that would, that would conflict with the Treaty of Rome. Um, and, and of course, the US behavior in the area of human rights is controversial to say the least. And, um, and the critics are frequently uh, criticize these cases, you know, who are these judges of the United States to, to hold uh, El Salvadoran generals accountable or to, hell, to hold Guatemalan generals accountable? Why aren't they going after their own uh, violators of human rights? There's some hypocrisy that, that's evident from these cases. And, uh, you know, clearly human rights organizations like Amnesty and Human Rights Watch uh, continually criticize our performance in human rights. And this, this notion of exceptionalism, that comes up that we, um, you know, every year we publish a, a human rights report where we criticize other countries' human rights records. At the same time, you know, we're committing some of the same violations. Um, and so I, I guess I've, I've safely answered the second question without committing myself too far into that. And that. Yes, we are criticized by these, these groups in this area. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how do you anticipate the number of interventions um, uh, changing? I would say, yeah, sure. Um, the question was um, how I anticipate the number of executive branch interventions in these cases uh, changing um, on, in January of 2009. Um, well, I think, um, you know, President Bush will probably be starting his third term then and we'll just have the same. <laughs> the, uh, I think regardless of who wins in, in November, um, the number will go down. Um, from, from simply, if, if uh, Senator McCain wins, the odds are he won't turn over lawyers in the Department of Justice and the Department of State as aggressively as if a Democrat wins, as if Obama wins. So we won't see the legal doctrine in those two agencies change as rapidly or as drastically. Um, the legal ideology that, that I've talked about won't change as much, of course, if you have the continuation of a Republican presidency. Um, the ideology there of 
of a strong executive branch with sort of almost unfettered control of foreign policy. And I, I believe that would exist, maybe not to the degree we've seen, but would exist in a McCain presidency and, and not so much in an Obama presidency. Okay. Yeah. Are you aware of any situations where um, a human rights violator was taken to court in another country, like say France or Germany? Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, um, Spain is probably the most um, aggressive prosecutor of human rights violations. They've um, they, uh, famously they went after uh, Pinochet, the former head of Chile, uh, while he was um, convalescing in London. They served a warrant. Spain served a warrant, or asked the British police to serve a warrant on him, and wanted him extradited for torture and, and other human rights violations. And um, Spain has since prosecuted other groups, including. Uh, Al-Qaeda and members of, of terrorist groups for human rights violations in Spain. And right now there's a case proceeding that, that some of these groups are a part of um, against uh, Guatemalan generals and for genocide and torture committed in Guatemala. Um, and so yeah, they're very aggressive. In Spain, uh, judges are act as prosecutors, so it allows them a, lot, a little bit more discretion in doing these. Uh, other countries have similar laws. Um, and uh, as I mentioned when the talk started, the United States is prosecuting Chucky e. Taylor for torture right now in Miami, and that's a, a really an unprecedented thing. It's a federal law passed 14 years ago that allows the Department of Justice to prosecute people for torture here in the United States, even if the crimes were committed overseas, as long as the defendant is a U.S. citizen or is found here. And so, um, you know, we might see more cases here as well. Yeah. Um, has any other country tried to go after and prosecute U.S. citizens while they were? Yeah, they have. France and Germany um, have uh, warrants against some of our current or recent officials. Um, depending on what day you check, Germany has outstanding warrants for um, Rumsfeld. Um, they're, every now and then they're dismissed and they file them again and then they're not dismissed. So uh, it just depends on what day you check. Um, it's actually really interesting. I was speaking uh, with some of these lawyers who were dealing with that case as well. And, um, and I asked them, you know, do you really think Rumsfeld is ever going to serve a day in jail? Is he going to go to jail? And the, the lawyer said to me, he said, well, no, I, I really don't, to be honest with you. I think he should, but I don't think he's ever going to. He said, but if we manage to keep him on the defensive and to make sure that we put enough evidence out there, you know, accurate evidence that portrays to the world that he, you know, what he's done uh, so that he'll be like the Pinochet of the next generation, where everyone will know that he wasn't this dignitary, that he was someone who advocated torture, then they'll consider that a victory. And with that sort of response, you see that you know, these groups aren't just legal. Right? There's a political agenda here, uh, this political motivation of challenging the U.S. human rights record as well. Um, yeah, as I said, I don't think you'll see Rumsfeld doing many trips to question. So. If I were his lawyer, I'd tell him to stay away. Yes. Is there any uh, move in Congress to maybe like repeal the alien tort statute? There have been a couple of. Um, couple of tries, and it's never even gotten out of the committee. Um, and uh, the only time it really came up was the Torture Victim Protection Act, where they actually endorsed it. Um, the last time it came up, I believe it was Senator Feinstein had a bill where she was going to limit it, and, um, and it didn't even get out of her office. She decided not to. Um, you know, it's a tough sort of thing politically. Okay. Keep in mind, you know, we're not talking about thousands of cases. Um, there are about 160 cases in district courts so far, and about 80 cases, 90 cases in the courts of appeals. So it, hopefully Congress has bigger fish to fry. Um, yeah. So we'll see. Yeah? Since uh, 1980, what kind of intervention have we seen from the Reagan or the first Bush administration? Very small. Um, the Reagan administration intervened a couple of times. There was this really uh, interesting case. Um, uh, they call Von, Van Dartle, Von Dartle, and uh, Von Dartle, uh, basically, uh, I forget the, the victim's name, and it's going to drive me crazy, but uh, he was a Swedish diplomat living in Europe when the Nazis um, took over, and he single-handedly helped 100,000 or more Jews escape the Nazis. After the war, when the Soviets came in, they, um, I think his name was Von Dartle, I think he, he has the same name as the plaintiff, Von Dartle. Uh, after the Soviets came in, they, they sent him to a prison and allegedly killed him for some reason. And so there was a lawsuit against uh, Soviet officials. And originally in the trial court, the Reagan administration filed a brief saying, hey, yes, you should have jurisdiction over the Soviets. You know, let's go after these guys. 
and uh, this is a horrible thing. And then I think they kind of clued in that, wait a minute, if, if the Soviet Union could be held responsible, then maybe so, so can our friends, like El Salvador or something like that. And then the Court of Appeals, they filed a brief saying, well, now that the Soviet Union has actually responded, we're going to ask for sovereign immunity to kick the case out, and they did. So just a couple of cases for Reagan in those regard. Uh, uh, the first Bush, even fewer, and again, there were very specific uh, foreign policy problems that they intervened in, treaties that were being uh, misinterpreted, these kinds of things. Um, and then in the Clinton administration, um, he, he intervened in favor of several cases, the cases against Ferdinand Marcos, and then that one against the Jap Japan for, about the comfort women they opposed. Uh, incidentally, in the very first case, the, the Philadelphia case, uh, President Carter intervened in favor of using the ATS this way. And the State Department for Carter thought this would be a great thing, that it would be another front on the war that the U.S. is fighting for human rights, he said. Uh, so Carter was all for it. All right, any other questions? Okay. Thank you all so much for your questions and your attention. I really appreciate it.